Does the Bible teach that the Earth is only a few thousand years old? Many scientists insist that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. But the Bible seems to teach that God made the Earth in only six days about 6,000 years ago. This leaves us with only three possible options. Either scientists are wrong about the age of the Earth, or the Bible is wrong about the age of the Earth. Or we are wrong to think that the Bible teaches that the Earth is so young. Which is it? Could we be misinterpreting the Bible passages that seem to say that the Earth is only several thousand years old? Could it really be billions of years old? Well, I'm not a scientist, but there are many very intelligent scientists who disagree with their mainstream peers and believe that the evidence, in fact, points to a young Earth rather than an old one. These young Earth scientists are, of course, in the minority today. But we should note at least that there is a healthy debate between these two views about the scientific data and what we should conclude from it about the age of the Earth. That being said, I don't intend to focus on scientific data in this particular video. I'll leave that to people who study science. In this video, we're not asking does scientific data support a young or old Earth, but instead, I want to ask the question, does the Bible take a side on this issue? Does the Bible actually say that the Earth is young? Could it be fairly interpreted both ways? To begin, we need to acknowledge that the straightforward, literal approach to the interpretation of the first few chapters of Genesis as real historical narrative does appear to describe a young earth. In Genesis 1, we are told that God created the earth in six days. Then, on the sixth day, he created Adam. In Genesis chapters 5 and 11, we are given genealogies that tell us how old each of Adam's descendants were when their sons were born, which allows us to count the years from Adam to Abraham, and they total 1,948. Add those years to the amount of time that has passed since Abraham was born, which was probably somewhere around 2100 to 2200 BC, and that would mean that the biblical creation would have occurred somewhere around 4100 BC, only a little over 6,000 years ago. That is the straightforward assumption that most Christians make when reading Genesis. But... There are several varying views of how to rightly interpret those first 11 chapters of the Bible, and three of those views argue that Genesis might not be as straightforward as it seems. It might not be telling us that the earth is actually that young. Here are three categories of views on Genesis that allow for an old earth. They are the gap theory, the day-age theory, and the mytho-historical view. We'll start with the gap theory, as it is probably the least popular of these three today. Gap theorists do teach that the Genesis 1 creation account is meant as real historical narrative, but they argue that it's an incomplete historical account. They say that there must be billions of years missing from the narrative that fit in a gap between Genesis 1 verse 1 and Genesis 1 verse 2. Verse 1 says that God created the heaven and the earth, but verse 2 says that the earth was without form and void. How did the earth become formless and void? Well, something must have happened to it, right? Somewhere between verse 1 and verse 2, something made it formless. This means that there must be some sort of gap of some time between the two verses. And since there is a gap there in which something happened, Who's to say that it wasn't a 4.5 billion year gap, right? This would mean that the creation narrative in chapter 1 is an account of God recreating the planet after it was destroyed between verse 1 and 2. Now, maybe this view sounds convincing at first, but it suffers from a few problems. The most obvious one is that verse 1 doesn't say that the planet Earth was created with a form. If it was created with a form, then we would need to explain why it was without form in verse 2. But since it never says that it was created with a form, the text of verse 2 shouldn't cause us to assume that it needed to be destroyed over billions of years to end up without form. 
Sure, the word translated as was in verse 2 could also be translated as became, which suggests that the earth was not formless and void, and then it became formless and void. But why would we choose that reading instead of reading it as the earth was form and void? Both of them are equally possible from the text. Plus, verse 2 seems to obviously be clarifying the statement in verse 1. God created the earth... But in case you misunderstand that, let me clarify, when he created it, it was formless and void. Verse 2 explains why God must form the earth on day 3, because creating it didn't form it. He created the elements in verse 1, but hadn't formed them yet. It's also interesting to note in verse 10 that God defined what he meant by earth in Genesis 1. It referred to the land, not to a planet. So when verse 1 tells us that God created the heaven and the earth, it means to say that God created the heaven, outer space, the universe, and the elements of matter that make up the land. But the land was covered with water, it hadn't been formed yet, so it was void or empty. These elements coming into existence could be described as the earth becoming, even though it became into a formless and void shape. That means that it doesn't matter whether you translate the verse as became form and void or was form and void, because either way, the context does not suggest a gap between the verses. And why would we assume that the text means to tell us that it was a formed planet earth but was destroyed and left formless after billions of years? There's no textual reason to add billions of years between the verses, especially seeing that later in verse 5, God spoke saying that the light and darkness were the first day. Why would God have to create light all over again just because the earth was destroyed? And why would he call that light and darkness the first day? Gap theorists are forced to literally interpret between the lines of the text in opposition to the clear implications of that text. This is not a good way to do any work in the field of interpretation, and that's probably why most Christians who do believe in an old earth do not believe in the gap theory. A much more popular view among old earth theologians is the day-age theory. Now, this theory is really a category of different views that all see the first few chapters of Genesis as poetic passages rather than historical narratives. If these chapters are poetic, then the word day, they say, could mean a thousand years, like it does in 2 Peter 3.8, which says, One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. It could even mean millions or billions of years, right? Day could refer to an age of time rather than a literal 24-hour day, couldn't it? And aren't there a lot of poetic elements in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, like the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and a talking snake? Couldn't the days of creation and the genealogies of chapters 5 and 11 be poetic as well? Well, this is at least a little more convincing than the gap theory, Since here, the day-age theorists are attempting to interpret the Bible as it was intended to be interpreted. They are simply claiming that it was intended to be poetry, not a literal historical account of creation. But here's the problem. We actually have biblical poetry about the creation of the world in the book of Psalms, and it doesn't sound anything like what we read in Genesis. I mean, not at all. For instance, Psalm 104 gives us an ancient Hebrew poetic account of creation, and it goes this way. O Lord, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. Notice all the metaphors in just these few verses. Light covers God like a garment. The heavens were stretched like a curtain. The depths of the oceans are like beams of a chamber. The clouds are like a chariot. 
This is very different language than what we find in Genesis chapters 1 through 11. None of the first chapters in Genesis use any obvious metaphor, the staple of Hebrew poetry. And the creation account in chapter 1 gives linear progression from day 1 to day 2 to day 3 and so on. Then the genealogies present themselves as if they are actual history. The text doesn't at all appear to be equivalent to any other Hebrew poetry in existence anywhere. Furthermore, the day-age theory has a few other problems because if each of the days of creation referred to long ages of the evolutionary timeline, then why did God state in verse 5 that the days were comprised of an evening and a morning? That sounds like a literal 24-hour day to me. At least Genesis seems intended to express that idea to its readers. Furthermore, if every day were a long age of time, then day-age theorists would need to explain how plants could have been created on day number three, even though the sun, which keeps plants alive, wasn't created until day four. Can we really chalk all of these holes in the theory up to poetry and just leave it at that? I don't think so, especially since the text doesn't at all appear to be written in the style of Hebrew poetry, and there's no reason to think that early Jewish readers of this book would have thought it was a poetic passage. Now, we'll talk more about the arguments in favor of interpreting Genesis 1-11 through as a historical narrative in a few moments, but first, let's move on and introduce the third, more modernly popular view espoused by many, if not most, Old Earth Christians today. That is the mytho-history view. Those who hold this view claim that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are not meant to be understood as historical narrative, but as mytho-history or symbolic retellings of true accounts in a metaphoric and exaggerated way. This, they say, is an actual genre of ancient origin texts, and they point to the earliest example of such a text in the ancient Sumerian accounts of Eridu Genesis. This account is a pagan version of a creation story that dates back to around 1600 B.C., It claims that the gods of the Sumerians created the universe, and it includes a flood story and a genealogy that traced the heritage of great Sumerian kings. Now, we know that this account is, of course, mythology. But mytho-historians argue that this kind of mythological creation account was very common in the ancient world. Basically, every ancient civilization had fantastic accounts of their gods creating the world, sending a flood, and a supposed genealogical record leading to their own ancestors. These are so common that it must have been, mytho-historians claim, a genre of ancient literature. It must have been a way in which ancient people expressed moral truths about their own heritage through intentional mythology meaning they wrote mythology knowing that it wasn't literally true. Now, this is a much better Old Earth view, in my opinion, than the two we've discussed so far, because it argues that Moses, when writing the first 11 chapters of Genesis, might not have intended to give the Israelite people a literal historical narrative of creation. He may have been writing in an exaggerated style that they were very familiar with, and that none of them would have supposed was necessarily literal. It simply expressed important truths in fanciful, exaggerated ways. Truths like the fact that God created the world, but exaggerations like the idea that he did it in six days. A truth like man chose to follow Satan and disobey God and was cursed as a result, expressed with a myth-like exaggeration about trees and a garden and a talking snake. I admit, if mytho-history can be shown to be an actual genre of ancient texts, and if the original audience of Israelites to whom Moses delivered the book would therefore have understood instinctively that it was not meant as a literal historical narrative, then this view could hold some water, because the goal of interpreting a text is to find the original intent for which it was written. If Genesis 1-11 through was intended to give its original audience an exaggerated or poetic retelling of true stories, 
then maybe the Bible doesn't teach that the earth actually has to be young. Maybe this does open the door to allow for an old earth without demonstrating the Bible to be false. However, this is simply not the case. Though it means well, there are still some major problems with the mytho-history view. First, there is no evidence that leads us to think that the original audience of the Eridu Genesis, or else any of the other supposed mytho-historical accounts, or for that matter, that even any of their writers knew them to be mytho-history. Are we to suppose that the ancient Sumerians didn't believe the Eridu Genesis was a historical narrative? They didn't believe that their gods created the world? Well, then why did they worship and sacrifice to their gods if they knew that it was just a mytho-historical text meant to exaggerate historical truths? Their devoted worship to the gods mentioned in these accounts suggests strongly that they believed these accounts, which means they were not written with the intent of being mytho-history, but rather they were clearly intended and received as actual history. Secondly, all of these ancient texts tell similar, though not perfectly identical, creation and flood accounts that match a lot with what we read in the book of Genesis. This actually lends credibility to the account of Genesis as a historical narrative. Think about it. If God really did create the world in six days, and if he really did send a flood to destroy all but eight people in the world, and every ancient society could trace its roots back to Noah, then we would expect that ancient civilizations from around the world would share common legends about a flood and about the world being created by God. Though these accounts would of course be changed over time, and we would expect that those who do not worship the true God would input their pantheon of other gods in his place in the story. That is what we would expect if Genesis 1-11 through is literally historically accurate. And that is exactly what we see in ancient creation accounts. All of these actually confirm the idea that Genesis is a literal historical narrative, and if it is a literal historical narrative, then the entire genre of mytho-history doesn't actually exist. Because all of those ancient accounts that historians classify as mytho-history are really true accounts of a creation and a flood, They've just been changed over time as they were passed on orally in different societies. That means that a believer in the mytho-history view has to first assume that Genesis 1-11 through is not a historical narrative in order to prove that there even is such a thing as the mytho-historical genre. Because if Genesis 1-11 through is an accurate historical narrative, then there is no such thing as a mytho-historical genre. They would all be true stories. They just got a few things wrong in their retelling of true accounts. The mytho-history view relies heavily on circular reasoning. So now we've noticed a few problems with each of the old earth views, but they aren't completely unworkable, right? I mean, can we really be sure about the correct interpretation of Genesis 1-11, through and does it really even matter? Well, I'll explain why I think it matters in a moment. But first, let's examine the context of Genesis 1-11 through to see if we can find any clues about its intended interpretation. Remember, what we're asking here is, can we determine what Genesis was written to convey to us? What was its intended meaning? We'll start with some contextual clues. Since Genesis was written by Moses, who was delivered the information contained in that book by God around the time when he met him in Mount Sinai, we should look at the context of all of the scripture inspired by God. First, if Genesis 1-11 through is mytho-history, it would be the only mytho-historical passage in all of the Bible. There is no other mytho-historical narrative found elsewhere in the entirety of Scripture. 
This peculiarity doesn't prove that it isn't mythohistory, but it does give us good reason to think that it probably isn't. Then, as we've already seen, the Bible does give us poetry that retells the creation story, but those passages look very different from what we read in Genesis 1-11. through So the greater context of all of inspired scripture should lead us to assume that Genesis 1-11 through is probably not mythohistory, if this is a genre at all, it isn't a genre utilized anywhere else in the Bible, and it also is probably not poetry either. Now, let's narrow our contextual examination to just the book of Genesis. The entire book was written to provide the brand new nation of Israel with foundational information about who God is, what his law and requirements for human behavior are, and what he had already promised and accomplished in the heritage of Israel. All of these elements begin in Genesis chapters 1-11 through and continue through the rest of the book. There is complete continuity. There's no reason to imagine a separate genre of writing in the first 11 chapters. For instance, in Genesis 2.24, we see the foundation for the seventh commandment, prohibiting adultery. In Genesis 4.10 and 9.6, we see the foundation for the sixth commandment, prohibiting murder. But these themes continue after chapter 11 as well. In chapter 38, Jacob's son Judah is found committing adultery with his daughter-in-law, but in contrast, his brother Joseph is found in chapter 39 refusing to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife. In Genesis 37, Joseph's brothers are wrong because they wanted to murder him. But in chapters 42 through 45, Joseph refused to retaliate and harm them when he had the chance. The point is that the themes of Genesis 1 through 11 continue and flow throughout the entirety of the book, which gives us additional cause to reject the idea that Genesis 1-11 through is a separate genre of literature from chapters 12-50. through Also, we see genealogies in chapters 1-11, through which we should assume are indications that the passages were meant as historical narratives. And the genealogies in chapters 1-11 through show the nation of Israel's lineage before Abraham in the same way that chapters 12 through 50 show Israel's lineage after Abraham. It's one continuous narrative. Now, you may be asking, what about all the fantastic mythological elements of chapters 1 through 11, like a talking snake, a tree of life, fiery cherubim, and a worldwide flood? Don't those things suggest that this is a mytho-historical or else a poetic genre? Well, no, not really. Theologians do not suggest that Genesis 12 through 50 is poetic or mytho-history, and yet there are many fantastic elements in those chapters as well. There's an account of fire and sulfur falling from heaven to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. There's the miraculous pregnancy of a 90-year-old woman named Sarah, There's a man named Jacob wrestling with God in human form. And there's Joseph interpreting dreams to save entire Middle Eastern peoples from famine. These are all fantastic, wonderful miracles, but that doesn't prove that the chapters were meant poetically or as mytho-history. Furthermore, in the rest of the books written by Moses, we have God speaking through a burning bush, parting the Red Sea, water coming from a rock, and giant Nephilim in the land of Canaan. But these things don't prove that these books were never meant to give us real historical narrative. They just prove that God worked miracles in the past to demonstrate his power and to teach mankind about himself. So why would we assume that this isn't what God is doing in Genesis 1 through 11? So, all the clues point to this as a real historical narrative, but does it really matter? I think it does, for a couple of reasons. First, because the other human authors of inspired scripture all seem to think that Genesis 1-11 through was a historical narrative. The author of Hebrews included Abel, Enoch, and Noah, three characters that we learn about in Genesis 1-11, through in his list of historical figures whose lives demonstrated faith in God. So obviously, he thought that it was a historical narrative. The author Jude wrote that Enoch was truly 
the seventh generation from Adam, confirming Genesis 5 as a literal historical genealogy. The Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3.20 that God saved eight souls by water in the days of Noah, and in 2 Peter 2.5 that God saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. In the book of Luke, chapter 3, the gospel writer recorded the genealogies from Genesis 5 as if they were historically accurate. And Paul wrote in Romans 5 and in 1 Corinthians 15, using the reality of the sin of Adam as proof of the reality of Christ's resurrection and salvation. Jesus himself even spoke of the days of Noah during his earthly ministry, referring to them as if they really happened and using them as a symbol of the reality of his future return. So if the author of Hebrews and the Apostle Peter and Jude and the Apostle Paul and Jesus all thought that Genesis 1-11 through was real history, aren't we discrediting them if we say that it was poetic or mytho-history? Furthermore, if you look at the second of the five books of Moses, immediately after Genesis in the book of Exodus, you'll see that God spoke audibly on two separate occasions about the importance of the people of Israel keeping the Sabbath. In both Exodus 20 verse 11 and Exodus 31 verse 17, God said that it was important that Israel rest on the seventh day of the week, because In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. And it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Since literally every passage in Scripture that refers to Genesis 1-11 treats it as a literal historical narrative, And since God himself used the literal six days of creation as a pattern for the nation of Israel to follow in their work week, I'd say that we should probably assume that it's a real historical narrative, right? And this is why I think it matters so much. Of course, we can disagree agreeably if necessary, and many wonderful, godly Christians whose theology I really respect do disagree with me on this subject. Most notable among those is William Lane Craig, an incredible apologist and an extremely intelligent brother in Christ. However, this subject matters because we can't just imagine a passage to be poetic whenever we don't like its interpretation. We have to let the Bible explain its own interpretation to us. It matters because proper interpretation of the Bible matters. But it's not just that. There's also a lot of doctrine that is based on a literal historical view of Genesis 1-11, through especially the doctrine of salvation and the consequences of sin. Paul wrote in Romans 5 that death passed upon all men because of the sin of Adam. In chapter 6, verse 23, he wrote that the wages or penalty of sin is death, and he continued to write of this consequence all the way through this epistle to the Romans. In chapter 8, he explained that the whole of creation suffered and experienced death because of the sin of man. He wrote in verse 19 that the earnest expectation of the creature, or created beings that aren't human, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, or humans. For the creature, the rest of creation, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. That is to say, that God subjected all of creation to the curse of sin in order to demonstrate to man that there is a better world waiting for us after Christ returns and purges it of sin and wickedness. He brought the curse of sin so that we would not hope in this world, but would look forward placing our hope in the next. Because, Paul went on to write, the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. It is really unmistakable that Paul is teaching here that pain, suffering, and death exist in the world as a direct result of the sin of man. 
And when God eradicates all sin, that's when the creation will be free from pain, suffering, and death. Here's the problem, and it's a big one. If God created the earth through billions of years of evolution, then he created it with pain, suffering, and death already worked in. If the old earth model is true, then God did not curse the earth when man sinned. He simply cursed mankind when they sinned. But besides the fact that this would make God the creator of an imperfect world that was designed on purpose with pain, suffering, and death, God actually tells us that that's not how pain, suffering, and death work. They are a direct result of the sin of men, which means they could not have existed before men did. And it leaves us with only one conclusion. For biblical theology to be consistent, the earth must be young. Now, I know there's a ton of disagreement about this among genuine Christian theologians, and I don't publish this video to silence that debate, but to add fuel to what I think is clearly the correct side of the debate. What do you think? Since the Lord gives us multiple references in Scripture that call back to Genesis 1-11, through and not a single one of them imply anything but its literal historical nature, shouldn't we conclude that it's meant as a historical narrative? What about the fantastic elements of the first few chapters of Genesis? Does God expect us to assume that he doesn't mean what he says in a literal way if and when he says that he does big, worldwide, fantastic things? Or does he expect us to believe that he is all-powerful and that fantastic miracles are truly possible with him? Scripture is replete with references to creation as a demonstration of God's power. Does God really want us to assume that creation was accomplished in the least miraculous way possible? And what about the problem of death before sin? Can we rightly interpret Romans 8 if we suppose that God created the world with billions of years of pain, suffering, and death before any man ever sinned and before God cursed the creation? I know you have thoughts on this, and I genuinely want to hear what they are. Join me in a few weeks when I'll stream a live Q&A video on this subject to give you the chance to ask questions or challenge my conclusions on this. Of course, as always, you could also let me know what you think by simply typing your thoughts in the comments below. Now, before I go, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, don't forget to hit subscribe to support the channel and to see more content like this. You can follow The Bible Explained on Facebook, too, at facebook.com forward slash The Bible Explained. Also, I want to give a big thanks to the folks at videobible.com for letting me use their awesome artwork in this video. Check them out on YouTube, and don't forget to hit subscribe. Now, I simply can't leave without reminding you that the entire Bible is ultimately about one thing, the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible tells us that all men are sinners, and justice demands that we depraved sinners pay for our crime against God for eternity in hell. That's definitely bad news, but the Bible is all about this good news, that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Since that penalty has been paid, all that is required of you is that you turn by faith to the Lord and find salvation in Him. If you've never chosen Christ by faith and received this gift of God, won't you do that today? Leave a comment or send me a private message on Facebook, and I'll be happy to talk to you more about having your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ.